Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session on scaling up treatment for TB infection in high TB burden countries. We've heard quite a bit over the last few days about treating TB infection in high and low income countries alike. Uh, IPT rollout, we know, has been slow or stalled in many different countries and settings, and treatment completion is often suboptimal. Meanwhile, rifamycin regimens, which are shorter and less toxic, are associated with greater treatment completion rates and may be more feasible for scale up, even in high burden countries. So in this session, we're fortunate to hear from several experts on different perspectives on preventive therapy, different options for treatment, and use in different populations. We'll begin with the first speaker to set the stage for us. This is Dr. Timothy Sterling. He is a professor of medicine and director of the Vanderbilt Tuberculosis Center at Vanderbilt University in the US. And he will be speaking to us on the efficacy of rifamycin-based <coughs> TB preventive therapy and experience of using 3-HB in low burden countries. All right, thank you. Thanks for the invitation to uh, speak at this session. So we'll move along. I have no conflicts uh, related to this uh, presentation. So I'll focus on uh, rifamycin-based uh, treatment regimens and then spend a fair amount of time on 3-HP uh, with updates on, uh, from recent studies in special populations and uh, operational data from low TB burden settings. This summarizes the 2015 uh, guidelines from the WHO uh, for treatment of latent tuberculosis infection in higher uh, middle income countries. So it's uh, recommended that they be tested and treated uh, persons who are at uh, increased risk of uh, infection and progression to active disease. Uh, testing with either an interferon gamma release assay or tuberculin skin test. But most importantly, uh, these are the treatment options, uh, the standard uh, six to nine months of isoniazid, then uh, three months of INH and rifapentine, three to four months of INH and rifampin, uh, or three to four months of rifampin. So I'll go through those uh, in the next few slides. Uh, of course, we're most familiar with uh, isoniazid, uh, when given for nine months, it's 90% uh, efficacious, but the uh, problem is the low completion rate. It's about 50%, and therefore effectiveness is diminished uh, with a median of about 60%. And of course, there are concerns about uh, tolerability with hepatotoxicity being the primary concern uh, uh, for each of these regimens. That's the second uh, thing there, so hepatotoxicity up to about uh, 4%. Isoniazid and rifapentine has not been compared to placebo, but has an estimated efficacy and effectiveness of uh, 90%, and that's because the treatment completion rates uh, have been high, uh, at, at least 80%, uh, due in part to the short regimen of three months, but also because it's been given primarily with uh, direct observation. Hepatotoxicity uh, has been low, and I'll get it some detail in a minute about that. Isoniazid and rifampin uh, is used broadly in the United Kingdom uh, and often used in children as well, has an estimated effectiveness of about 50 to 60 percent. There are concerns about hepatotoxicity because of both isoniazid and rifampin uh, given together. And then rifampin uh, alone has been studied for three months, a study in Hong Kong. Um, uh, but uh, the four-month regimen has not been uh, evaluated. There is a uh, study uh, that Dick Menzies is leading, a multinational effort, and the results should be out in the next year or so regarding effectiveness of this regimen. But it is well, well tolerated. Uh, there are concerns uh, about uh, giving uh, rifampin alone in HIV-infected persons, particularly if uh, uh, active TB has not been excluded because then there's a possibility of, of developing rifampin resistance. So that's the summary of, of, uh, of those regimens, both from an effectiveness and tolerability standpoint. Helen Stagg, uh, a couple years ago, presented uh, this work. And it was published in the Annals. Um, there have not been head-to-head -head comparisons of uh, many of these regimens. So she performed a uh, network uh, meta-analysis and um, looked at both the effectiveness in preventing active TB as well as the primary uh, toxicity endpoint of hepatotoxicity. And there were 53 studies that met her inclusion criteria. And 
in this uh, network meta-analysis, these are the uh, odds ratios for effectiveness or efficacy uh, within the network. And you can see that they're fairly comparable, six months of isoniazid, 12 months of isoniazid. You see all the regimens. Uh, so 40 to 60% uh, effective. These are the, the primary effectiveness results of uh, three months of rifpentine and isoniazid compared to uh, uh, nine months of isoniazid. And these are the uh, uh, TB uh, events that occurred during the 33 months of follow-up from enrollment in the 3HP arm and then in the uh, 9H arm. And this uh, was of, of borderline statistical significance. Now, this was a non-inferiority study, and the non-inferiority margin was 0.75%. And that's illustrated here by this line. So as you know, with non-inferiority studies, you take the event rate in, in the two arms and you take the difference. And if the upper confidence bound of that difference is less than 0.75%, then you can claim non-inferiority. And you can see at 33 months of follow-up that the upper confidence bound was well below the non-inferiority margin. And in fact, was close to zero had it been Below that, we would have been able to claim uh, superiority, but, uh, but uh, at least here you're clearly able to claim non-inferiority. Now, there have been several recent uh, publications on this regimen in other populations, children, HIV-infected persons, the issue of possible flu syndrome, hepatotoxicity, uh, the evaluation of self-administered therapy, and then some data from operational settings. So I'll go through those now. These are the data from children. Um, there were uh, uh, 1,058 uh, children total, 908 for the efficacy evaluation. There were no hepatotoxicity events, no grade four events, and there were no deaths. You can see treatment completion of the 3HP arm was high, 88%. Uh, and significantly greater than in the 9H arm. Low rates of drug discontinuation due to adverse drug reaction, and then uh, very little tuberculosis. No cases in the 3HP arm, and uh, only three in the 9H arm. So the upper bound of the uh, uh, confidence interval of the difference was 0.44%, so less than that 0.75% delta. So therefore, we were able to claim non-inferiority of, uh, of effectiveness in children. Now, it's also been evaluated in HIV-infected persons. There, the, the regimen was evaluated, you're probably aware of this, uh, Neil Martinson, who will be speaking next, Dick Chason, and others in Soweto. Uh, and in a setting of um, uh, all HIV-infected persons um, and, and done in Soweto, so a high TB incidence area, and the uh, rate of TB was uh, similar to that uh, uh, among those receiving isoniazid. These are, this is a little more recent, uh, came out uh, just earlier this year uh, from study 26, and there were uh, not that many people, about 200 in each arm, uh, but again, high treatment completion rate, so 89% in those who received 3HP. It was uh, well tolerated. Uh, you can see here drug discontinuation, grade three, four, and five uh, toxicity. Uh, of note, hepatotoxicity was significantly lower in the 3HP arm, and there was uh, very little uh, flu syndrome. This summarizes the effectiveness in the HIV-infected population, again, in, in, in uh, relatively low uh, to medium TB uh, burden settings, and um, uh, with the rate in the 9H arm of 3.5%, 1% in the 3HP arm, this is the difference. And so the upper bound, the 95% confidence interval, uh, 0.6, so again, less than that 0.75% margin, so enough to claim non-inferiority in this uh, population. Now, there were reports of uh, possible hypersensitivity or flu syndrome shortly after enrollment into Study 26 uh, began. Uh, it had not been reported previously, so we assessed uh, clinically significant systemic drug reactions and also uh, quantified uh, severe events, those uh, defined as hospitalization, hypotension, anaphylaxis, or grade four toxicity. And of the adults, about 7,500 of them who received at least one dose of drug, there were 153 systemic drug reactions. 
And it was significantly greater, greater in those who received 3HP, 3.5% uh, compared to 0.4% in the 9H arm. And uh, of these, uh, 13 were severe. There were no deaths. In a multivariate analysis, the factors independently associated with this flu syndrome were white race, female sex, increased age, and lower body mass index. Severe reactions were rare and associated with 3-HP concomitant medication of any class. We were, we were not able to, uh, it was not uh, associated with a particular drug class, and also a white race. The underlying mechanism is unclear. There have been reports of uh, rifampin-associated flu syndrome uh, having a, a, uh, an association with antibodies, but in uh, work, uh, preliminary work uh, that's um, uh, underway, uh, there does not appear to be uh, an antibody association, at least in, in uh, this group of patients. Regarding hepatotoxicity and hepatitis C, uh, this was evaluated within uh, study 26 of the PREVENT TB study. Of the uh, 6,800 uh, adults who took at least one dose, there were 79 episodes of hepatotoxicity. And as I mentioned earlier, it was significantly lower in those who received 3-HP than those who received uh, nine months of isoniazid. We performed a case control analysis to look at the role of uh, hepatitis C and its association uh, with the patotoxicity. So uh, the first is just in, in the overall group in the PREVENT TB study, and these are the results of the multivariate analysis, so the independent factors associated with the patotoxicity, increasing age, female sex, uh, white non-Hispanic race ethnicity, a uh, higher body mass index was associated with a decreased risk of hepatotoxicity, elevated baseline AST associated with an increased risk, as was nine months of isoniazid. And the, it was the case control study that allowed us to then specifically look at hepatitis C. And after adjusting for all of those factors, it was independently associated with an increased risk of hepatotoxicity. So uh, the risk was higher in, in, in 9-H than in 3-HP, uh, underlying hep C, and ele elevated baseline AST were risk factors for hepatotoxicity. So the 3-HP regimen uh, may be uh, particularly of interest for persons at increased risk of hepatotoxicity. Bob Belknap and others in the TB Trials Consortium uh, evaluated self-administered therapy uh, uh, with, with the 3-HP regimen, and these are data that had been presented at CROI, and the paper is working its way through uh, the clearance process at CDC. It was uh, done at several sites, uh, including in South Africa, uh, as well as sites in North America. Um, the non-inferiority margin uh, for treatment completion was 15%, and MEMS caps were used to measure adherence. And there were three arms, direct observation, self-administered, and then self-administered with text message reminders. And these are the completion rates, 87% uh, with DOT and 74%, 76 um, percent here with the, with the two self-administered arms. And you can see discontinuation due to adverse drug reaction was similar to what was seen in study uh, 26, the PREVENT TB study. And this shows then the uh, non-inferiority uh, margin of 15% and the upper confidence bound. So this is the comparison of DOT versus self-administered, DOT versus uh, self-administered with electronic test message reminders. And so uh, uh, they were unable to claim non-inferiority. Uh, from a completion standpoint, the self-administered regimens were inferior to direct observation, but the completion rates were high. Um, at, uh, at about 75% in that uh, self-administered arm, higher than the 50%, which I mentioned is traditionally what happens with nine months of isoniazid. Critically important is surveillance after the regimen rolls out into the general population. That's when hepatotoxicity with isoniazid and with two months of rifampin and pyrazinamide was uh, detected. So CDC has launched a surveillance uh, uh, set, uh, system uh, for it, and uh, 16 sites across the United States over this five-year period, over 3,000 persons who started therapy and were eligible to complete during this study period. 
Interestingly, the completion rates were higher than those reported in the randomized controlled clinical trials, uh, and uh, particularly high among children, which is good, and even among difficult populations like uh, the homeless, I think in part because of the, the shorter uh, regimen, but also the direct observation. And importantly, adverse event rates were similar to the PREVENT TB study. Now, there have been several papers within the last few months uh, looking at 3-HP in operational settings. And I know time is tight. I'll just, uh, we've got this slide and the next. So in Colorado, in a high school, in New York City, in the health department, in California, in an urban county jail, you'll see that completion rates were good. Uh, here it was a little bit lower in New York, but 94% in Colorado. Um, all of these are, are relatively small. Uh, in California, it was 85% completion rate. And then uh, in Atlanta, at the Fulton County Health Department, Milwaukee, at a community health center, <clears throat> and then among renal transplant candidates. Uh, so in all of these settings, the, although samples are small, but there are now several of these uh, reports showing a good completion and good toler uh, tolerability and low rates of toxicity. So in conclusion, Rifamycin-based therapy uh, of, of MTB is effective and safe. The short course regimens are favored due to their uh, high treatment completion rates and good tolerability. The three-month regimen of isoniazid and rifapentine is safe and effective and associated with high rates of completion. And data from operational settings uh, confirm the safety and tolerability that have been reported in clinical trials. And I'd like to close by acknowledging uh, the many people involved in, in this study, as well as the uh, persons who uh, enrolled in them. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent and comprehensive overview and help setting the stage for the rest of the talks. Um, I guess we'll be, in the interest of time, we'll save questions for the end. We'll have time for discussion for all the speakers. So I'd like to invite our next speaker up to the stage. It's Dr. Anna Mandalakis, who is the director of the Global Tuberculosis Program at Baylor University School of Medicine in the U.S. And unfortunately, her co-speaker, Dr. Um, Donald Skinner, could not be joining us today, but she will be presenting on preventive therapy in children, policy, practice, performance, and perception. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here this morning and talk with you a little bit about preventive therapy in children. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, and I aim to give you an overview of IPT policy and performance in child TB while we explore some unique considerations and challenges in pediatric populations. So the first take-home point for you today is that IPT is effective at preventing TB in children. There's a lot of evidence to support that statement. The most recent bit of evidence has been a meta-analysis done on eight RCTs that looked at IPT versus placebo in over 10,000 children who had a mixed exposure infection risk. It was also a very heterogeneous population with respect to factors that might mediate the efficacy of IPT, including age, HIV, and TB endemicity of the setting. And there was also heterogeneous IPT usage across the studies, both respect to dosing and the nature of the prophylaxis. Um, so in addition to showing that INH hepatotoxicity was qualitatively minimal, um, the most important measure was that IPT decreased the risk of TB by 59% among children between the age of four months and 15 years. So there were eight studies in the meta-analysis. The, the meta-analysis team deemed six of these eight studies to be of high quality. The first three studies included exclusively HIV-infected children, and the first two studies, actually the MADI studies, included children less than four months of age who had no previous TB exposure. So the isoniazid aimed to prevent, per, aimed to prevent TB infection, so primary prophylaxis. The remainder of the studies, three of them actually only included children who were TST positive, so the isoniazid aimed to prevent progression to disease, secondary prophylaxis. 
So when we look at the results of the study, these are the summary statistics, so you can see lots of heterogeneity and also this relative risk of 0.65. But we need to divide the study, look a little more closely at the primary prophylaxis versus the rest of the studies. So what you see actually is that the Mahdi studies were really large and carried 50%, over 50% of the weight of the meta-analysis. And the relative risk was 0.65. When you look at the rest of the studies, it's 0.41. Um, so this differential weight of the infant studies also affected the ability of the meta-analysis to look at all-cause mortality, um, the effects of HIV, and also the um, endemicity of the setting. I'm just going to hone in a little bit on the stratified analysis of HIV because it actually has informed policy. So if you look here um, at just the HIV negative studies, we have this risk reduction of 0.55. If you look at the HIV positive studies, which are the two Maori studies and the SAR study, we have this 0.86. Um, if you remove those infant studies, we have only the SAR study left and we're down to 0.28 now. So this actually collection of studies is actually, you'll see what's informed policy. So in conclusion from this meta-analysis, we can see that IPT is effective at preventing TB in children at risk, particularly children who have close contact with smear positive TB cases. But we need more evidence on IPT use in young and HIV infected children and an optimal length of treatment. All right, so the second take home message is that INH toxicity is rare in children. And so when we think about the cost benefit ratio of, I, of IPT in children, this really helps to push benefit. And there's lots of evidence to support this. Lots of old studies from the 50s and 60s, 70s, observational showing that most of the side effects are. Um, GI, nausea, vomiting, and then more recent quantitative study with this is an excellent study that was a retrospective study of all US liver transplant centers over seven years. And it showed that the probability of non-fatal hepatitis in children on IPT was 0 0.003. All right, so we're gonna move on to policy. In the last six years, there's been a lot of policy that's come out on IPT in children. So 2010, we had our three eyes looking at IPT use in people living with HIV. Then 2012, guidance on contact tracing. 2014, update to national TB programs on treatment of children with TB that include preventive therapy guidelines. And all three of these policies are well harmonized. They recommend that children under five years of age in household or close contact with people who have TB who after an appropriate evaluation to rule out TB should be offered six months of IPT. That's a strong recommendation because of the high quality of the evidence. Um, these guidelines also uniformly recommend that children living with HIV who are greater than 12 months of age, who after symptom-based screening are unlikely to have TB, and they have no contact with the TB case, also get offered six months of IPT as part of a comprehensive HIV care package. Um, and this is in TB high burden settings. And it's a strong recommendation despite the low quality of the evidence. Um, we actually, for those same kids living in medium or low burden TB settings, you might offer them IPT as part of their comprehensive HIV care package. So just um, in July of this year, some new HIV guidelines came out. Very interestingly, there's a new guideline saying that adults and adolescents living with HIV who have an unknown or positive TST um, should actually be offered 36 months of isoniazid preventive therapy. Um, and it's a conditional recommendation because of the moderate quality of the evidence. And another thing that we're seeing in many of our partner sites, interestingly, is that some implementation catching up to this policy down here, which actually says that among children living with HIV who after being treated for active TB for six months, should now get an additional six months of IPT. We're actually seeing this start to start to happen in a lot of our partner sites. All right, so just pause for a moment, and this is one of our expressions that we talk about a lot on our Baylor team, which is um, IPT is IPT. So about a year after joining Baylor and presenting the kind of information that I just shared with you, one of my close colleagues said to me, that's all really interesting, but you know, 
I PT in the under fives, I PT in the HIVs. It gets kind of confusing. The most important thing is that we encourage people to get preventive therapy to these children. Um, so what's going on in practice with IPT with respect to children? So this year, for the first time, WHO has actually reported on IPT usage in child contacts under five. They have data from 47% of the countries, including nine of 30 high burden countries. And the estimate is that 7% of children eligible for IPT under five following contact actually initiate IPT. Um, it's higher in WHO low burden regions, and in high burden countries down here, it ranges anywhere from 2.6% to actually 41% in Malawi, which isn't bad. We have some encouraging data coming out of Benin, which actually shows this is feasible. Um, so what we see here is a study that was done in two clinics, a simple intervention to prove adherence. They report on outcomes at two, three and a half, and six months. So these bars are one clinic, this bar is the other clinic. The first and third bar are pre-intervention. The important bars are the third and fourth bar, which is post-intervention. And you can see they were really able to effectively improve adherence and actually have a sustained effect. Really cool, they were also able to actually follow outcomes throughout the child contact management cascade. So you can see 499 identified cases. Almost all evaluated and initiated IPT. 86% adherent at six months, and they were able to actually capture six deaths and three progressions to TB disease. Um, as Timothy shared, we actually have data showing IPT, um, showing 3HP is effective in children, um, and so non-inferiority of 3HP compared to nine months of isoniazid, um, no difference in hepatotoxicity, um, discontinuation due to adverse events, but a 7% higher rate of completion. And this is very cool. The union is now actually looking at 3HP um, in four countries, in Benin, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, and Central African Republic. It's a five-year study, so we all have to be patient and see, see what we learn from this, but it's really exciting to see it happening. Um, so there are lots of options for preventive therapy in some settings, like in the United States. Um, so in Houston, we can give kids a lot of different things. The bottom line is that we see improved adherence in regimens that are shorter duration and less frequent dosing. But there's some cons associated with all of these, particularly cost. And actually, so for the, re the regimens requiring directly observed preventive therapy, we can't always provide that to children. But in, in general, based on some of our local data, we prefer to give four months of rifampicin daily or three months of weekly 3-HP. Um, so some of, us, some of the local data that drives our treatment decision making, this is work done by Andrew Cruz and Jeff Stark. So they actually looked, um, and this is observational clinical practice data, they actually looked at um, adherence factors associated with poor adherence. So here you can see in their univariate analysis, poor adherence was two times more likely in children of foreign birth, almost 12 times more likely if they self-administered their treatment. And actually, if the child was identified outside of a contact investigation, almost eight times more likely to have poor adherence. That's because the contact investigations come along with more support for giving the medicines. So if you look at the multivariate analysis, what we actually see is that if the child receives directly observed preventive ther therapy, they were seven times more likely to complete treatment. Okay, so more data from Houston locally. This actually looked at over 400 kids and it compared two things. Looked at four months of RIF, self-medicated, versus nine months of isoniazid directly observed, no difference in completion rates. And then if we look at four months of RIF self-medicated versus nine months of isoniazid self-medicated, almost eight times more likely to complete um, for the four months. Okay, there's more, so why do people default on IPT? And we're starting to see more and more um, work done in this area. Um, this is data from US studies, um, a pediatric study and an adult study that tells us some of the things that we just talked about. Duration of therapy makes a difference. Also side effects. Um, and then 
some of the things that healthcare workers might be, how they interact with patients, and the patient's perception of their risk. Um, so some of these things are modifiable factors, some are not. So in 2009, my team started working with Donald, who unfortunately couldn't be here. So Donald Skinner is an HIV, um, he, he's a social scientist that's worked in HIV adherence for a few decades. So I presented IPT in children to him, and he said, so you mean you're asking this mom to give her kid, who looks completely healthy, this really, really bad tasty medicine every day for nine months, and she has to come to the clinic what, once a week to get the medicine, and everybody watches or force her kid to take this medicine. And you want to think about how we can change her behavior and make her more enthusiastic about doing this. Mm -hmm. So we, this is the con conceptual model of the work that we did. So this is the theory of planned behavior, and it says that a behavior is driven by a person's intention to actually complete that behavior. And their intention is informed by three constructs. Their attitude, the subjective norms around them, and their perceived behavioral control, which is some of the things that we have been talking about with our more traditional um, quantitative research that I, I shared. So we've done some quantitative work and qualitative work to actually get a better idea of what determines caregivers' behaviors with respect to giving preventive therapy to their children. And so what you see is that some of these things, oops, sorry, like controls, so are they able to get the kid to swallow the medicine? Can they get to clinic? Can they get the medicine? How often do they have to do this? That contributes. But also, and our work has been done in South Africa and actually Swaziland more recently, so the social norms around them greatly contribute to their intention. So these things are like TB stigma and IPT stigma in an HIV hybrid and setting that goes along with the HIV stigma also. And there's this concept of love for the child, which is, do I love my child more or less if I actually give them this medicine? And then their attitude actually comes from things that we, we would expect. Um, so this is knowledge of TB transmission, knowledge of IPT, so things that the healthcare worker can mediate, their relationship with their child, their risk perception of TB, and also their beliefs about IPT, including its efficacy. So we're continuing this work. Um, we hope to get some additional insight into how we can modify caregivers' behaviors. Um, it's really exciting to see the momentum at this meeting about preventive therapy. And um, I think that we need to do things like make sure we have good regimens that are shorter and less difficult to give, but we also think about ways that we can motivate and change behavior in people. And I actually want to encourage all of you to uh, join the campaign and step up for TB and emphasize that this also includes uh, screening contacts in IPG. So. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Since Anna actually has to go present in another session this morning, are there any questions for, for her now while we can capture her while we have her? If so, please go to one of the microphones. Please feel free to email me or grab me or anything if you have thoughts later and one of them we're about to go for doing. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> Thank Thanks, you. Anna. All right, so if there's no questions, we're going to carry on then with the next presentation, which will be from Neil Martinson, who heads the Perinatal HIV Research Unit in South Africa. And Neil will be talking to us about novel rifamycin-based TB preventive therapy regimens and strategies for high burden settings. Thank you, Neil. Okay, good morning, everybody. <coughs> um, I'm uh, just, uh, the first slide is sort of to try and remind people about what high burden uh, settings are. And you can see that. Uh, on the left-hand side, there's uh, the ranks of the uh, health districts in South Africa by the annual TB incidence. And you can see that in some of these uh, areas, uh, more than 1% of, uh, of the population is uh, being uh, notified for TB every year. 
and that is really incredibly high. And similarly, you'll see, and I've switched this uh, graph around from the WHO on the other side to try and get a, a, an sort of equivalence. Um, and you'll see that those uh, three countries of Lesotho, South Africa, and Swaziland are in this uh, very high burden uh, setting. And really, that um, this this uh, thank you this high burden um, setting really informs. Uh, the manner in which you provide uh, preventive treatment because of this, the high risk of uh, the annual risk of infection, and in in small children, about two and a half percent of uh, kids will be infected with TB every year. And if you assume that that's what's happening in the in the general population, then if you give someone IPT and then you stop it, one presumes that they will have this uh, this level of risk for reinfection every year. So that really gets to the durability of isonizing preventive treatment. And in, in our settings, high HIV prevalence settings, initially there was uh, six months of isonizing was uh, recommended. And these are two studies that had uh, long-term follow-up after people had received isonizing preventive treatment. And you can see that uh, the, the effectiveness of this uh, intervention wanes after uh, two years and two and a half years in these patients in the pre-antiretroviral era, really um, uh, calling out for, for more durable regimens. And if we remember George Comstock's original work, which showed that uh, giving uh, nine months of isoniazid was almost like a vaccine, so that even 20 years later, he was able to detect discernible differences in people who received and didn't receive uh, preventive treatment. And here we're seeing that uh, the, the protection wanes after such an uh, incredibly short time. So we did a, a study in uh, South Africa looking at uh, three novel re regimens and compared them against uh, isoniazid uh, for six months. And uh, in the top right, you'll see that uh, rifapentin with uh, INH uh, was given weekly uh, for three months. And uh, rifampicin INH was given uh, twice weekly for three months. And INH uh, daily self-administered. And you can see the, the DOT, the two rifamycin-containing regimens were DOT with uh, a no supervising uh, treatment and the other two regimens were, were self-administered. And you can see the, the group of people that we recruited, uh, most of them came from, uh, had recently delivered and were women uh, coming from the PMTCD program. And it appears that most of them had been diagnosed relatively early in the, in the course of their disease because their median CD4 count or their mean CD4 count was above 500. And so we specifically recruited uh, people who were relatively well to allow us to have uh, um, long-term follow-up. And at the time of initial recruitment, and this is uh, really going back into prehistory, uh, historic times, because antiretrovirals in South Africa were only became widely available in 2004, and we were recruiting for this study while this happened. So um, we, we, um, these patients were then followed up and started on antiretrovirals uh, as time uh, came on. And these are the overall results uh, for the study, uh, risk of TB or death using the, using the per pro protocol analysis, and essentially including all people at all, uh, at all um, for all the uh, follow-up time that we had. And you can see it, uh, just a, a quick glance at this really shows that no regimen uh, really came out strongly as being uh, uh, significant superior to, to any of the others. And but if you and if you'll excuse uh, my um, uh, this uh, the statisticians, if you could just close your eyes for the next couple of slides. But um, <laughs> if you look down in this uh, bottom uh, right-hand corner, and that's it's enlarged, then you can see um, the blue line is uh, rifapentin with INH. The um, and it really shows the. In, Within the first six months, we had no, the treatment had lasted for three months. So we had no cases of TB in the first uh, uh, six months. And if you, if you use your imagination and you say, okay, well, if we, if we gave three months of, uh, of preventive treatment and then we gave it again about here, how flat, how flat could, we, could we keep this, uh, this blue line? 
Um, so I think that's one of the things that, in, that informed uh, some of the uh, uh, future slides that I'll tell you about. But if you can just bear in mind this sort of 100 times magnification of the, of the initial um, part of this uh, study. Um, the, this, uh, the, the orange line, as you'll see, is the isonized um, uh, for um, the continuous, what we call the isonized continuous arm. And that was uh, given for, for as long as people could take it. And in the isonized continuous arm, as people's CD4 count declined to 250, we referred them on for antiretrovirals. And at, at the beginning of, uh, of the antiretroviral program in South Africa, people were very reluctant to add another drug to the, to the ART regimen. And the leading cause of stopping this isonized continuous regimen was because people were starting antiretrovirals. Um, so the other thing that I'd just like to highlight, which is sort of in relation to this, uh, this part, is that we, th we did a, an analysis, and, and this also, there weren't enough patients to, to really show any statistical significance, but it does give a, a sense of, of uh, the protection while you're, taking the, while you're taking the stuff and while you're not taking the stuff. And so it almost, uh, while you're taking preventive treatment, it, it's almost like, I suppose, a bubble that is protecting you from getting TB. And particularly, you can see this in, uh, in the continuous arm, is the stark differences between the, the rates of TB while, uh, while people are, are taking, uh, actually drinking the preventive treatment and thereafter. And it's, it's sort of also uh, shown in, this, uh, in the six months arm. So, the other thing about uh, preventive treatment that we should remember is that uh, a lot of this initial, um, this initial uh, low rates, particularly in these uh, two, may be related to, the, to active, uh, active and intensified screening that we did just prior to randomization. So uh, most of these patients weren't, weren't enrolled and randomized on the same day. But if they had any hint of, uh, of uh, active or, uh, tuberculosis or tuberculosis disease, we would then investigate them uh, quite strongly. And in, uh, I think recalling, most of the patients would spend two or three weeks before, from the initial consent to the time of randomization in trying to exclude active tuberculosis. So um, this might be an artifact of, our, of the intensive uh, uh, screening for TB at baseline. And you can see the fairly high rate of, uh, of tuberculosis in these individuals, even though they had uh, relatively high um, CD4 counts. And I think we were able to confirm TB. There were 90 cases, and I think we were able to confirm TB in about uh, 75 of them. And so this is just a reminder of that, uh, the, the per protocol uh, treatment. And here you can see we, did, we then said, OK, well, if you analyze this data uh, as though uh, using the people who took uh, the continuous preventive, uh, the continuous uh, INH, uh, only while they took it and to 30 days thereafter. And for the others, we only included people who took, I think, at least 60% of their doses. So essentially, we were trying to say, if people did what, uh, what we intended to uh, with this trial and, uh, and, and not uh, get stopped because they were taking antiretrovirals or, or, or not take enough doses, if we had to see as they were intended to, to what would the results be? And you can see that this, uh, the continuous arm comes out quite strongly as, as, uh, as protecting people from TB. And, this was confirmed with the, with a trial from uh, Taras Samandari, which showed a similar effect of this uh, three years of uh, preventive treatment uh, protecting uh, very strongly uh, against TB. And uh, Gavin Churchyard's other uh, work in Tibela shows the same thing, that while, you, while you're taking uh, preventive treatment, there's a strong protective effect. And as soon as you stopped, and in, in this high, extremely high uh, annual TB incidence uh, setting, uh, the rates rapidly uh, return to, to the, to the uh, placebo arm rates. And so in terms of the adverse events, once again, we, we uh, collected adverse events throughout the whole uh, duration of the study. But uh, here I've highlighted in the, 
in uh, this arm, in the Rifapentin INH arm, is that although we had a, a, a ton of adverse events, uh, very few of them were while uh, people were taking uh, uh, treatment. So you can see here, only 4% of them occurred while people were taking treatment. And the rate of hepatotoxicity in this arm, I think was, out of all these patients, I think 1.5% of them had uh, hepatotoxicity. And the other, I guess the other thing is that uh, you can see that permanently discontinued, very few of the patients here were permanently discontinued, suggesting that these short course regimens are much easier to take and uh, don't, require, um, don't require you to stop and start. And fewer people will stop and start. So this brings us to, the, um, to this idea that rifapentin containing, uh, containing preventive treatment uh, um, regimens might be more potent. You probably get much better adherence, fewer adverse events related to the, to the drugs that you're taking, and it requires less of a burden on the, on the healthcare system. So Gavin is, uh, is about to do this study uh, called WIP-TB, uh, comparing uh, periodic or cyclical um, uh, episodes of, uh, of taking three months of uh, weekly rifapentin and INH and comparing that to what the current standard is, which is uh, isonized uh, for as long as possible. All in HIV infected adults. And this really, I think that one of the things that in, in our setting is that we sort of seem to be uh, fairly uh, constrained by saying, well, we only give preventive treatment to HIV-infected adults and to children who are contacts. And really, I think the time has come to start looking at uh, controlling this epidemic by adding, um, by including other people, for example, uh, seronegative individuals who close contacts of a TB case. And then just, you know, when we talk about isoniazid and preventive treatment and all these things, really the biggest resistance that we have is people giving, uh, giving preventive treatment. And uh, I just put this in because the theme of, this, uh, of the conference is resistance. And uh, there's this recent data from, from South Africa. And no one is using, in South Africa, no one is using uh, rifapentin INH as, as preventive treatment or, or rifamycin as preventive treatment. But I think the, the, what I would like to highlight here is that this, uh, there have been two surveillances of drug resistance in South Africa, and the most recent one uh, was published recent, uh, about a month ago, reporting data from uh, uh, 2012 to 2014. And you can see this is comparing the surveillance uh, about 10 years prior to that. And in the, in the new patients, you can see MDR is relatively stable. Any RIF resistance in new patients is rel relatively stable. But here, Rif mono is, uh, has gone up probably by, I think it's doubled in, uh, in this period. And I think that we should just be, we should be somewhat uh, cautious about, uh, about uh, resistance and, and the concerns of people who are prescribing this, because they, there's definitely going to be uh, resistance to people from, from clinicians and others uh, who have concerns about, uh, about selecting resistance in patients who are inappropriately treated. So, Thank you very much for your attention, and I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Dick Chason, who, who got me started on this, uh, on this road. All right, so we're over time a bit, so we're going to continue with the next presentation. And I'd like to introduce Hamida Hussain, who, oh, sorry, who, I've jumped the wrong person here. <laughs> oh, it's Hamida on the, oh, okay, well, we'll start with, anyway, because on the program it's an amusing, but anyway. Oh, do you? No, it's fine. <laughs> the the go-to presentations are. My slides are next. Okay. Sorry. That's fine. So uh, Josie is from Cornell University and will be talking to us about the pharmacokinetic aspects of 3-HP regimens in special populations. Okay. Thank Sorry. You. Okay, great. Um, so thanks for, uh, for inviting me to speak at this conference, I'm going to talk about um, special populations, as Gavin mentioned, and for the purposes of this talk, special populations are going to include children, pregnant women, and people living with HIV. Um, and I, it's really great to be able to speak to kind of a more general audience. Often when you work with special populations, you get put in a special symposium, and so it's nice to be able to talk to kind of a broader audience. Um, 
So I wanted to start um, to emphasize why it's important to do pharmacokinetic studies, and especially in these special populations, uh, by kind of doing a, a brief history of, um, of HIV treatment and what we've learned from PK studies in HIV. So lopinavir, as many of you know, is a protease inhibitor that we use for HIV. It was approved back in 2000, and when it was first approved, it was, um, it was great because it had a better toxicity profile than some of its previous protease inhibitors. Um, it had good PK data. And right around then, remember, we were, for prevention of mother-to-child transmission, we were still largely using AZT monotherapy or single-dose nevirapine. And so this was a nice option to potentially, as we were turning towards um, combined antiretroviral therapy for PMTCT. This sounded like it was a good option. But as we started to use lopinavir in pregnant women, clinicians were starting to publish case reports of women who had virologic rebound in the third trimester. So they'd be completely suppressed during pregnancy, and then all of a sudden, right before they're going to deliver, they started to notice the viral load was detectable again, which could have implications for the mom as well as for her infant. And it wasn't until 2006 when the first dedicated pharmacokinetic study of lopinavir was done in pregnant women, and that confirmed what many clinicians had been observing, which was that the lopinavir, the changes that happened during pregnancy was affecting the metabolism of lopinavir such that the dose actually needed to increase during the third trimester to keep the woman virally suppressed. So currently the, the guidelines are the same. You, you use the, the regular dose for the first couple trimesters, but then you actually increase the dose of lopinavir during the third trimester. Um, and so I think this tale kind of um, reminds us that changes in dr drug metabolism, specifically in some of these special populations that I'll discuss, have significant clinical impl implications, and so we need to think about including these populations in clinical trials as early as, po as possible. So um, to switch to 3HP, so you know our pediatric colleagues will often tell us and remind us that children are not little adults, um, and that's true, and I thought this diagram kind of um, captured the changes that happen in infants that can affect drug metabolism, including um, changes in renal function, changes in GI absorption. And so um, when it comes to 3-HP, actually the first studies we had about the pharmacokinetics of rifapentine in children came from a study in children that did not have tuberculosis. So these children were receiving rifapentine for skin infections, for staph infections, and they used the standard dose-based regimen. So children that were less than 30 kilograms were getting the 150 milligram dose, and then kids who were over 30 kilograms got the 300 dose. Um, and there was a crush form that was available if needed for some of the smaller children who couldn't swallow the pill. So they measured both the rifapentine levels as well as its active metabolite, which is the 25 decacetyl rifapentine. And the goal was to compare the um, PK parameters in the children as compared to the data that we already knew from um, adults. So what you can see in this diagram is that the, um, the 150 milligram dose is these darker circles, so the, in the lower curve. And so you can see that the lower dose actually resulted in uh, similar peak concentrations, but it was rapidly metabolized um, faster than the 300 milligram dose. So um, the half-life was shorter, the clearance was faster, and the time that you spent at this maximum dose was actually also um, smaller in the children who received the, the lower dose. Um, and that was particularly true if they received the crushed formulation. Um, so when they then integrated the data from the children with the data we already knew from adults, they found that this was a true um, age-dependent mechanism. So the clearance of the drug out of the blood system was um, dramatically higher as, as people got older. And so it was not an allometric just based solely on weight. It was actually something about the younger kids were metabolizing the drug faster than the models had predicted. So the first time we see rifapentine in children, as um, Tim and some of the others have mentioned, was in the, in the PREVENT study. So um, the study, I think, started in 2001. Children were included starting in 2005. And they did a single PK sample from the children. And so learning from that previous study that was not done in tuberculosis, um, they knew that the dosing for younger children needed to be higher. So um, they smartly, for the younger children, they did a higher mg per kg dose. So the youngest children were getting 21 to 30 milligrams per kilogram as compared to adults who were getting the standard 900 milligram dose, but that really calculated out to less than 18 milligrams per kilogram. So if we kind of boosted the dose in the younger children, could we achieve levels that were similar to adults? So um, what they found is, on the, uh, here is the children who took the whole tablet, the children who took the crushed tablet, and then the adults who took the whole tablet. And the point of 
this slide is really just to show you that the children were able to, to achieve either in crushed or whole form similar levels of the drug to adults, if not significantly higher. Um, and I think most times we get concerned when we see that the drug levels are too high, especially in children. But it was very well tolerated. There weren't increased adverse events. There was no real problem with the higher doses. And um, just to remind everyone that you know young children are ones were very concerned about the progression of latent to active disease. So if we err on the side of too high, and they tolerate it, that's fine because we don't, we're particularly concerned about them getting active disease and dying. So this was considered a good thing. Um, and what the authors actually went on to suggest then is that in children, we shouldn't just use dose-based regimens, but rather we should use a combination of age as well as weight. So age is on the y-axis, increasing age as you go down. And then this P3, P10, whatever, is the percentile of um, that you are for weight, so the percentile for age. So if you were, for example, a six-year-old and you were in the 20 or 50th percentile, you would get for weight, you would get the 300 milligram dose. But if you were the 75th percentile for weight, you would get the 450 milligram dose. So this was kind of integrating both of the factors that they saw in their model affected the drug metabolism. Um, the FDA doesn't currently use this. The, you know, the data was just based on a sub-study from the PREVENT trial, which was done generally in low-burden countries. It was primarily white and Hispanic children, um, so the generalizability was not confirmed. But there is a dedicated study of the pharmacokinetics that is being sponsored through TBTC. Um, study 35 is a phase 1-2 dose-finding study of 3HP specifically in children. And, um, and you'll see that they are including kids from 0 to 12 years old, so the PREVENT trial was only 2 and up. Um, so we'll finally have data on that on that very young child group, and they're including HIV-infected and uninfected children. So um, the way the cohorts are broken up, the first two will enroll first, and those are the children from 2 to 12 that we already have some data on. So you'll see that they're actually oversampling for cohort 3 and 4, which are the 0 to 2-year-olds. So by enriching that sample and adding it into the data that we already have in the older children and adults, we'll be able to um, kind of more confidently comment on what the appropriate doses are for children. Um, so that's coming. Um, it's approved and it's in the works, it's just not started yet. Um, so then to switch gears uh, to talk about pregnant women. So pregnant women, I think everyone agrees, are not just larger adults. Um, they have a lot of changes that happen both physiologically, immunologically, and I think it makes us even more scared to research them than we are even with children. Um, but the changes that happen, as we saw in the first example with lopinavir, um, can affect drug metabolism and can have clinical implications. So I think we just need to be aware of them as we design studies. So I, I summarize some of the changes here in terms of increased gastric emptying and GFR. Um, but one of the big changes that really affects um, drug metabolism is the decreased albumin, for, specifically for medications like rifapentine that um, are protein bound. Um, you want to take that into account. But, you know, the point of the slide is to kind of relay how complicated a lot of these changes are. And so you can't just look at decreased albumin and look at rifapentine and predict what's going to happen in a pregnant woman. There's the hepatic metabolism that changes. There's the GFR that changes. And so you really need to include them in trials to be able to see what actually happens, not just try to use, um, just try to guess based on um, what we know. So we don't have any PK data of this regimen in pregnant women at all. Um, but what we do have is safety data. So in the um, PREVENT trial, which again is this, the trial um, Tim talked about in the first talk, which was comparing the 3HP regimen with 9H, um, and then the IADHERE study, which was all people who were taking 3HP but either got directly observed therapy or standard uh, or self-administered therapy. So Ruth Morrow took um, the women who became pregnant while on either of these studies and then looked at pregnancy outcomes and infant outcomes, which um, she presented last summer. So um, what she found was that the three, whether you were in the 3HP arm or in the 9H arm, the, um, the number of live births, elective abortions, spontaneous abortions, or congenital anomalies were comparable, not only between arms, but also with the general population. So it doesn't seem that there is a significant safety signal from either regimen um, in pregnant women. So you know, the conclusion of the abstract was that it's likely safe, but again, this was based on retrospective data that was not um, 
that was not necessarily designed to take into consideration pregnancy. So for example, many of the women who received the 3HP regimen were um, either had a spontaneous abortion or they were recommended to stop the medication. And so we don't have long-term data, but it at least hints that there aren't any major safety signals. So through the impact network, um, uh, I and some of the others in the room are part of the study team that um, are going to look at the phase one and two pharmacokinetics, safety, and tolerability of the 3-HP reg regimen in pregnant and postpartum women. So um, we're specifically enrolling pregnant women both with and without HIV, and we're enrolling women both in the second trimester and the third trimester, and then we're following them through delivery and then following their infants um, postpartum. So the main objectives are really just to define the population of pharmacokinetics, which is a nice way of being able to compare the PK parameters in pregnancy with adults without having to do a large study where efficacy is the endpoint we can compare the PK parameters with adults that we know had an efficacious um, dose and then be able to use a smaller sample size. So you can see our goal is really just 50 women. Um, and we're going to be enrolling in US, in the US, Haiti, Thailand, Kenya, Malawi, and Zimbabwe. So hopefully we'll have enough diversity of data to comment on the use of the medications in different populations. Um, so the design of the study, like I said, will enroll women in the second trimester where they'll get intensive PK sampling around their first dose, and then we'll follow them th through the third trimester. Most of them will finish their regimen around um, third trimester, and then we'll do repeat PK sampling. So we'll have longitudinal data to be able to say how the pharmacokinetics of the dose changed in the same woman between second and third trimester. Then we'll also enroll women in the third trimester, and they'll finish their regimen sometime in the postpartum period. So we'll have second trimester, third trimester, and postpartum data to give us the full spectrum of how changes may happen. And similar to the pediatric study, we've oversampled in the third trimester because we anticipate if there are any changes, it would likely occur during that time. And so we want to make sure we have enough data from that period. Um, so as for 3-HP and HIV-infected populations in general, and, and some of the other speakers have gone over some of this data, um, from the PREVENT trial, we know that uh, efavirenz is likely safe to use with the 3-HP regimen in non-pregnant adults. There wasn't specific pharmacokinetic data, um, but in the in the people that were on it, they didn't have any virologic rebound, so it doesn't seem that the effect decreased efavirenz enough to you know, cause any problems with their HIV control. Um, there, has, there have been pharmacokinetic studies with raltegravir, which is one of the integrase inhibitors in non-pregnant adults, and, and the two medications did actually interact to increase the levels of raltegravir in people who were taking 3-HP and raltegravir, but there were, again, no safety signals from it. The higher levels of raltegravir didn't seem to cause a problem and certainly aren't going to compromise their HIV control, so it's likely that raltegravir can be safely used in non-pregnant adults with um, the 3-HP regimen. PIs, on the other hand, the protease inhibitors cannot be used with the regimen at all in any population. Um, rifapentine likely decreases the protease inhibitor levels, and so um, per package insert, it is a contraindicated medication with this regimen. Uh, so there's a lot going on, but there's still a lot left to do. So. Um, you know, in terms of pharmacokinetics of the 3-HP regimen in children and with and without HIV, hopefully we'll have data from TBTC35 soon. And we'll also have some data on better formulations for children. So they're using a combined regimen that's kind of like, um, like an Alka-Seltzer tablet that you drop in the water and it dissolves on its own. And so hopefully we'll be able to know if that's a better formulation for the younger kids as opposed to the crushed tablets that were used previously. We'll have data from pregnant and postpartum women from IMPACT 2001, hopefully, um, by next year. And then I, I mentioned the 3-HP with raltegravir, which is one of the integrase inhibitors. Dolutegravir is the other integrase inhibitor that there will be data on. Alice Pau is, is leading a study that um, they just presented a, an abstract at ACCP, which was last week, but I couldn't find it online, so I don't know what it shows, but, um, but the data is coming on whether or not that's safe to use. But again, that's in non-pregnant populations. So use of integrase inhibitors with 3-HP in children and in pregnant women, we still don't know um, if that's a safe option. So uh, conclusions, uh, just to remind you that you know, by excluding some of these special populations when we design studies um, on some of the newer regimens, I mean, there's so much going on with TB research in terms of shortening latent TB treatment, shortening active TB treatment, multidrug resistant TB treatment. But when we exclude these populations or don't consider them in our drug design, we're, we're 
preventing them from benefiting from some of the research that we're all working on. And so I think just remember the lopinavir case and consider the special populations early in your clinical trial design so that everyone can benefit from it. Uh, so if you're interested in hearing more about uh, management of tuberculosis in children and pregnant women, we have another session this afternoon at 1.30 in Hall 1C. Uh, so please come and listen if you're interested. Um, that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Any clarification questions? Yes, one of that. Yes, Kelly. Sure, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So um, the question was about the progression of latent to active disease in pregnant women. Um, so there's a lot of work that's still going on with that, but the, um, epidemiologically, we know that the risk of active tuberculosis uh, occurs primarily in women of reproductive age and specifically in the early postpartum period. So the risk is about, um, there's a large epi study that was done out of the UK um, by Zenner's group um, and showed that the risk of TB was double in the um, in the peripartum period. So um, we suspect that it's during pregnancy the um, TH1 immune system gets somewhat suppressed um, to allow the fetus to exist, um, but that suppression does allow some risk of infections. We know listeria is increased, malaria is increased. So um, we think that there's a similar process going on, but there are the kind of direct immune changes that happen in pregnancy and what they do to TB specifically is not really clearly defined. Great, thanks. So we're now going to move on to the next presentation. So um, Hamida Hassan is going to, who's the country director for IRD uh, in Bangladesh, will be talking about lessons from the field and experience of scaling up 3HP in Pakistan, not Bangladesh. <laughs> in Pakistan. That's where um, I'm from, so that's where my work was. Um, with the permission of the chair, I want to we had to change the topic a little bit, if you remember our discussion, Gavin. Uh, we, we did want to present the experience of 3HP in Pakistan. However, um, our funding sources were from the Global Fund, and because rifapentine is not a recommended uh, drug for high burden, low resource setting, we could not access the drug. Um, after a lot of negotiations, Global Fund finally agreed uh, for us to purchase this drug through their uh, portfolio. However, we had to go through, we had to curtail the size of our uh, uh, implementation to an operational research. We had to gain IRB approvals for it. Um, and finally, after all that, the drug is still not with us because GDF and the manufacturers are still working out their uh, processes. So we will hope in the next few months to have that drug with us. And after that, hopefully next year, we will be able to present that. Uh, but in the meantime, what we do want to present to you is the post-exposure treatment for drug-resistant TB patients in Pakistan. Um, this was a small pilot uh, that we did um, for those patients for who were exposed to drug-resistant TB in their household. Uh, the objective of the study was to assess the proportion of household members with disease in a household with a pulmonary TB, DRTB patient at baseline, to assess the effectiveness of preventive therapy uh, in those that were eligible for this post-exposure therapy, to assess the risk of development of disease uh, in those contacts not eligible for post-exposure therapy, so we will follow them up, um, and to assess the proportion of adverse events. And of course, looking at the uh, treatment adherence. Uh, the method is, uh, we, this is a prospective evaluation of 100 households with TB patients uh, who we are screening and testing. The population is, uh, are these 100 DRTB patients, they are in Karachi in a limited geographic setting uh, of uh, Kurangi and Landi. This is a subset, uh, this is a town in uh, Karachi where this where Indus Hospital is located and where the PMDT site is located. Uh, the duration uh, of the study is from quarter two this year and will end in quarter four of next year. Our eligibility criteria is all children who are under five years of age. 
will be screened and provided with post-exposure therapy if they live with a uh, patient who has a drug-resistant TB uh, and is under treatment. For children 5 to 17 years of age, if the child has a positive tuberculin test or has an immunocompromised condition or is malnourished, and for those that adults that are 18 years and above, if the person has an immunocompromised condition or malnutrition. So in all other words, those that are higher risk of getting DRTB from the contact in their household. Our overall process flow includes um, once the uh, index patient is identified and put on treatment, uh, the um, patient is approached and we ask permission to visit their household. If we do get visit, uh, permission to visit their household, then a health worker goes to the household, verbally screens everybody in that household with the permission of the um, um, household head, and then requests all children to actually come back to the clinic to be evaluated by a medical officer for disease or otherwise, and any of the symptomatic uh, adult patient are then also brought in for uh, further evaluation. Uh, during the clinic visit, if the child or the adult is considered eligible for the post-exposure therapy, then they are started. If they are not considered eligible, then we just note them and then we follow them until the, uh, until the index patient in that household completes the treatment. Um, this is just individually uh, the algorithm. It's the same uh, process. Just wanted to add that for Children under five, we, we, when we do physical and clinical examination, we also do chest x-rays, CBCs, and if the sputum is available, then we, can, uh, we test them for expert as well as um, DST and uh, culture. And, and they go through very good clinical rigor to find out if there is disease present in those children or not before they're given the post-exposure. Similar with the 5 to 17, just the TST is added to that uh, process. And for uh, 18 and above, uh, the same process is followed um, and um, before evaluating. So this is the drug regimen that we are providing to them. Um, if the in isolate the, of the index patient is susceptible to fluoroquinolone, then we provide them uh, with, uh, with levofloxacillin and ethambutol. And if the, uh, if the isolate is resistant to fluoroquinolone, then we provide them with moxifloxacillin and ethambutol in appropriate uh, dosage. One of the um, focus of, of this project is to do proper counseling uh, because it's very important for them to understand uh, the mode of transmission as well as risks to the contact. Uh, so both the index patient as well as the contacts of the index patient undergo very thorough counseling at baseline as well as uh, 15 days of after treatment initiation and that and at every single clinic visit subsequently whenever they're coming in for their clinic visits. The data capture is all electronic. These are just of the screen captures uh, to let you know what the data capture looks like. And we record all the adverse event that the patients are uh, following. So the patients, um, after initiation of the treatment, they come in for their first uh, follow-up visit at the first month and then two months subsequently. So. Um, Some of the results, and this study is still ongoing, so um, we don't have the treatment outcome results, but I will give you all the process indicators. Um, we have thus far uh, evaluated 102 um, MDRTB households, of which we had to exclude 23 because of various reasons. So of the eligible 79 households, uh, we have approached 75 households, four are in the process. Of these, three households have refused us permission to come to their home for evaluation, so they were excluded. Uh, and finally, our sample size is 72 households that we have evaluated. Of these, uh, in 35 households, we have completed all the screenings, and 37, it's ongoing. And this is ongoing because you don't find everybody in the house at the same time. So you have to visit these houses multiple different times to ensure that all the contacts are screened. So of these um, households, we have 
identified 553 contacts that have been approached. Two contacts specifically refused to be uh, further evaluated. Um, of, then of the 551 contacts, 538 have, have been verbally screened, whereas 304 have been investigated as they have come back to the clinic and they, they were further medical officers have evaluated them. One of the contacts found, was found to have disease and the person was started on uh, treatment. So of the 304, 179 uh, people were eligible for post-exposure therapy based on, our, based on our eligibility criteria. And of these, uh, 69 have started on post-exposure therapy. Four refused to start the medication even though they were um, eligible. This is the age and gender breakdown of uh, the contacts that were screened verbally at homes. Pretty much one is to one ratio for between male and females, but the age breakdowns as per our eligibility criteria is um, there. Um, those that were eligible and started post-exposure therapy, uh, for children under five, there were 23 uh, children. Uh, from 5 to 17 years, uh, there are 37 children, of which 3 had positive TST, so that was their criteria of starting the post-exposure, whereas majority of them had malnourishment um, as the major criteria for starting the post-exposure therapy. Uh, on the 18 and above, also 9 patients have started, uh, 9 people have been started on post-exposure, of which 7 were, um, had low BMI and 2 had diabetes. Uh, again, um, age and gender breakdown of those that were started on it, uh, started on post-exposure therapy. So far, um, in about a major a majority of our patients are still under treatment, and they have completed about uh, the first ones have completed about uh, three or four months of treatment, but we haven't uh, had major side effects being reported. Some of the minor side effects that have been reported to us so far is reduced appetite, joint and muscle pain, and generalized weakness. But on an overall basis, the post-exposure therapy is well tolerated um, up till now. Um, so as I said, this is an ongoing study, so we don't have results. Patients are still on treatment, and hopefully in the next few months, we will have the first patients completing treatment, and we would know uh, more about what happens. And their follow-up is going to continue on until the index patient completes treatment in that household. Um, so we would have about a two-year follow-up for most of these patients at the end of it. Um, just want to acknowledge the team that is on ground um, and is working very hard. Our national TB program, who has been with us every step of the way in this uh, process and have actually provided us free drugs for these patients, second line drugs. Um, our funder, which is the Harvard uh, Global Health Delivery Center, and our partners, IRD and IHS. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mida. No, don't go away just yet. Are there any questions for clarification? Yes, Vicky. We're just following them up. The reason for inclusion is we don't have drugs for them. I, they're fluoroquinolone resistance. The major, the regimen is based on fluoroquinolone, so we are, um, hopefully, someday we can use the new drugs for those patients and see what happens. Yeah. Yes, there's one at the back. So, um, yes, there, there is demand for it, but we have to educate the patients. So the patients that come to Indus Hospital, they undergo extensive counseling. Um, and that is part of the reason there was a high uptake. And as long as they understand uh, the reasons um, why they need to take it, they take the drug. Um, uh, one other thing that I want to point out is in our study population, we've had multiple cases from the same families, which 
have actually convinced our clinicians as well as some of the community members that yes, this is important because you get one case and then you have another in the same household within a short period of time. So they understand the transmission. Great. Well, thanks very much, Amida. So this is now open to some general discussion. We have about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So if anyone wants to ask any general questions. Yes, sir. Ah. Yeah, so just in the WIP trial, we are including, if I can just start with the children first, so children from the age of two and above, and as soon as the PK data for the less than twos become available, they will be included. Pregnant women are currently excluded, but as soon as we have the PK data, they will be included. We've already written that into the protocol. Well done to that. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Yes, I can't. So the lights in my eyes, so I can't see who <laughs> <laughs> it is. So would any of our speakers like to answer? I guess the, the, there are such high rates of infection in high burden countries and sometimes that's considered a reason to not uh, try to treat everyone who's latently infected. Um, how can we change that paradigm? Is that <laughs> Me of uh, of um, uh, TB infection in settings like ours, where uh, in Cape Town, about 80% of uh, all adults uh, have evidence of uh, TB infection, and uh, in other settings it might be slightly lower, but it's still uh, the majority of the population by adulthood will will have evidence of TB infection. And clearly, you can't go around. Uh, well, maybe you can, but certainly not now. You can't go around treating uh, everybody for TB infection. So, I think that. Uh, these uh, there's there are new efforts to find better markers of uh, of infection that uh, that better predict whether or not you're going to get TB disease, and I think that within the broader population of people uh, that are infected, we could probably do better by identifying those that are more likely uh, uh, using epi epidemiological or, or some biomarkers that we have already to identify those ones that are more likely to progress to TB disease. But uh, clearly there's some population like, like prisoners and uh, um, minors and others who are at incredible risk of developing TB disease and of course uh, HIV infected individuals. Maybe if I can just add to that, there was in the abstract driven session on L2BI the other day, it was a very nice modeling paper that looked at where, I think they were using IPT, but basically any preventive therapy is like, oh, you're there, you're in the audience, right, so why don't you comment, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Right, any other questions? Yes, Kelly. Yes, yeah, just as
So you're asking me all the... <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to answer, but... Uh, <laughs> well, I would echo the words of George Comstock, who did all the work in Bethel, and that showed the spectacular, durable protection in a setting where there was epidemic TB, 3,000, no, it was soon a half thousand, but 100,000 population. He said the best vaccine is natural infection followed by treatment of infection. Um, so that was his take on why it was so durable. But I think when you look at all the studies from Botswana, from South Africa, yes, there is a rebound, but the rebound never goes above what it was at baseline. It doesn't get worse. And so I think the epidemiological data doesn't support that concept. And again, in one of, well, I can't remember, Roman, if it was your paper or one of the other modeling papers, but again suggesting that treatment provided protection, it sort of had a vaccine-like effect or a booster-like effect. I think it was yours, was it? Not. One of the, the modeling papers from the other days tended to suggest the same thing. But are there opposing views or alternative views? That's uh, distinct then from people who have active TB. Yes. Be, uh, those with active disease have an increased risk of Correct. subsequent TB compared to the general population, yeah. whereas latent infection with or without treatment of latent infection appears to be at a decreased risk. Correct. Right? Yeah. Thank you. I know there was one question here first, then I'll come to you. Right, so from the TB vaccine trials, I mean, that's clearly very important. So we tend to take all of that into consideration when planning the trials. Um, so the longer you make your follow-up in your vaccine trial, the more likely you are to expose yourself to reinfection, and that may undermine the apparent efficacy of your vaccine. So one of the ways you can do that, but not only vaccine, but uh, treatment of infection trials, is to limit the duration of follow-up so that you're really looking at the effect of the vaccine or the treatment on the, the current infection rather than reinfection. Right, another question? So I guess mine is more of a comment. So I agree it's more than time to scale up treatment for TB infection, but we need to think much more about the systems that are needed to scale it up. Um, because we have a lot of successful pilots, but we know that some of the, implicate, the, the, the barriers to scaling up is cost, because pilots are project funded, programs don't reach to where we should be providing preventive therapy, which is the lower levels of the healthcare system. They sit at facilities. We know that preventive therapy is scarce if it's initiated. Given the patients are found at the household level, we need to look at the demand of the patients to know that they have to ask for it. But we have to like strengthen the system and the programs move beyond the TB programs to use existing platforms at the primary care level to actually be able to scale up. So therapy. I think that's a great comment to conclude on. <laughs> and just to state that that has been taken to heart, there is a unit aid call that was issued, I can't remember when it was, but it's, they'll be announcing the results with sometime in December to do exactly that. So it's to use the unit aid to catalyse the adoption and scale-up of 3HP in high burden countries. And um, part of that process is to deal with the supply chain issues. So currently 3HP is at $72 per patient course. That's clearly unaffordable for any high burden country. It will never fly at that cost. And so the, the part of how we can drop that price is through volume uptake. And the second thing is to bring in generic companies. And so as part of this whole unit aid proposal is to do just that. It's to drive volume, bring in other generic manufacturers, work with countries to adopt, create the demand and scale up. Yeah, so. but in the meantime, we have INH, and there's sure. going to be INH dispersible available and mm -hmm. skills sort of there, things programmatically. Absolutely. And global funds, et cetera, to push for that. And Correct. Yeah. So that's what we're encouraging 
countries to do is to, because a lot of countries are busy writing their global fund reapplications, and so we're encouraging people to put in for massive IPT programs, and then when 3HP does become available, they can then reprogram that money to scale up 3HP rather than INH. Well, thank you very much to our speakers and to the audience. It was a great session. Thank you, Lisa.